what is making the biggest impact on your life, what are the unmet medical needs for our loved ones with PWS, and what are the community's thoughts about clinical trials. Um, so Susan, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Um, so as, as sort of a background to this, um, to this survey, uh, we hopefully everybody is aware that there are many uh, ongoing and upcoming clinical trials for Prader-Willi syndrome to address some of the um, symptoms associated with PWS, including the hyperphagia or excessive appetite, some of the behavioral issues, and the obesity. And so there are many, or there, there are several experimental drugs that are currently being investigated. And these drugs have to go through the process of being studied in PWS. And before they can come to the market and be available to all people with PWS, they have to receive FDA approval. Um, and that process is a complex process by which the FDA considers what are the potential benefits of the drug and what are the risks. So is the drug effective and what are the safety concerns? Uh, so the next slide shows the, um, how the FDA goes about uh, doing that. And, and what they do is a benefit risk assessment of, um, of the particular drug and looking at the particular disorder. So Susan, I can't see the next slide yet. Um, and so they gather information about the condition, and then they gather information about the drug and how the drug uh, potentially treats the condition, and what are the risks associated with that drug. And that's a process that is done um, in the FDA by experts in uh, metabolic disease or, or what a, you know, cancer or whatever disease um, the drug is being developed for. Um, but it was apparent to a lot of people in the disease communities and the, the disease advocacy communities that that process needed the input of patients. Um, so on the next slide, um, Susan, you can see that um, in uh, 2012, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, the FDA was reauthorized by Congress um, to, uh, uh, to um, carry out its duties. And in among that legislation was a, uh, a patient-focused drug development uh, concept. And this is a concept that was put forward by many in the rare disease ad uh, advocacy um, space as well as in um, many disease advocacy spaces. And the idea is that patients are uniquely positioned to let the FDA know what are the benefits, um, what the benef potential benefit of a drug might be, what are the important symptoms that that disease uh, or, or patients with that disorder are facing, and how might a, um, a treatment affect their daily living and their long-term living. Um, and that the FDA really needed to systematically incorporate the patient's uh, perspective into the drug approval process. So it was not enough for the FDA, um, just based on their clinical knowledge, to decide whether or not a drug was well suited to the population. They have to, by law now, incorporate the patient view. Um, and um, this process of gathering the patient's viewpoint is a work in progress with the FDA, um, but they're seeking to really listen to the patients and formalize that, that process, and that is sort of a, a work in progress at the FDA these days. Um, and to, since we knew in the PWS community that we're having all these drugs that are potentially going to come up for that approval decision, one of the um, major priorities of uh, FPWR or organization as well as uh, the Prior Release Syndrome Association USA was to begin a dialogue with the FDA to make sure that they really uh, understand PWS and can understand the risks, um, uh, the, the potential benefits and unmet medical needs in our population. So the next slide shows a first step in that. Um, back in June of uh, this year, earlier this year, um, I went with um, Jim Kane, who is a longtime advocate of PWS research, along with uh, Janelle Heineman, who is the Director of Research and Medical Affairs at the Prader-Willi Syndrome Association USA, and Rob Lutz, um, who is a, uh, a member of the Board of Directors of PWSA USA. Um, we all went up to the White Oak campus of the Food and Drug Administration and had a meeting with, um, it was actually 
very many of the high-level officials in the FDA. And I have to say they were extremely attentive and really wanted to gain an understanding of what prader willi syndrome is on, from the patient perspective, from the impact on the family, uh, you know, what are our needs as far as a patient community goes, and what are the um, risks that we would be willing to accept for a drug that might be effective. So we know that no drug is 100% safe, and so uh, there needs to be an understanding of what level of risk would be acceptable to our community uh, if a drug proved effective for some of the, the, the major symptoms of PWS. So this began that dialogue, and it was, um, it was a great first step, um, and each of us who went is a parent of a child with PWS, and so we could both give a view of the community as well as our own personal experience. And as I said, the, um, the attendees who spanned um, the FDA from the um, Center for uh, Drug Evaluation and Research uh, to some of the uh, groups that look at study endpoints um, to the metabolic branch and the psychiatric branch, uh, all of those people were involved in that meeting and um, were very attentive. However, I think that this process needs to be an ongoing process in which not only do we represent, you know, our own stories and our understanding of the community, but in which we gather data from the community and make sure that we're faithfully representing that to the FDA. And that's where this patient survey came from. So um, the next slide uh, just uh, talks a little bit about that. Um, the purpose of this online survey was as an early step to make sure that the voice of the entire PWS community is known to the FDA and that we're accurately representing um, what we think is, is um, the needs and the um, priorities of the community. So our method was an anonymous online survey to gather information about uh, you know, we're, it's supposed to be patient views, but of course that presents its own challenges in an intellectually disabled population and also a population that includes many younger uh, individuals. And so in this case, we were gathering the um, parent, primarily the parent view. Um, and we were looking for the, their views on the impact of PWS um, to the individual with PWS, as well as to the primary caregiver and the family, the severity of the disorder, how effective are the current treatment options, and, um, and those are all aspects that the FDA uses in assessing whether a new drug is needed and um, whether a new drug um, is going to meet the needs of the community. Um, and we also wanted to gather some information about our community's attitudes towards clinical trials because we were quite fortunate that we're going to have a lot of clinical trials. We want to understand what are people's concerns about those clinical trials, um, what are the things that can make it easier for us to get these clinical trials done. Because if these um, companies and universities are not able to complete the clinical trials, then we will never get to the point of the FDA deciding whether or not to approve a drug for our population. And historically, for many disorders, uh, the hardest thing for getting a drug or the, one of the major places that a drug potentially can fail is in the clinical trial if not enough people will enroll in the clinical trial. So we want to understand people's concerns about the clinical trials as a way to um, educate our community about the, the clinical trials, to hear our community's concerns and be able to address those concerns. So the caveats of this, um, this process where this is an online survey, this was not a very, uh, this was not, you know, an academically rigorous survey. So we had no method to confirm the diagnosis. We, um, we just, you know, took, it at, it took you at your word if you said you were the parent of a child with PWS. And the questions weren't extensively validated. So a lot of times for academic questionnaires, the questions will go through a process of making sure that everybody understands exactly what's being asked. In this case, we were really just trying to get an overview of some of the um, biggest impacts of PWS on people's lives and, you know, some of the concerns. So the survey went up uh, on October 21st, and the data that I'll show tonight uh, are from uh, the data that were gathered from the 21st of October through uh, November 3rd. We distributed notification about the survey through email blasts and, and Facebook, and I apologize if <laughs> 
for the many Facebook postings if you got sick of those. Uh, but our community, of course, as always, just really responded beautifully, um, and uh, we're so appreciative of that because it does allow us to feel like we are representing a, a, a pretty good um, portion of our, our community. So within you know three days, we had over 500 responses, and the data from October 21st to November 3rd represents about 780 total responses. Um, so just to start to get through some of the data, the first few questions we asked were about demographics. Um, so um, we were looking primarily for parents of, of uh, children, either young children or adult children with PWS, and that was uh, who responded in most cases, about 92%. Uh, percent. In some cases, it was a legal guardian, because of, of course some people are, are not with their parents, or a sibling or a professional caregiver, and, and there were small percents of each of those groups as well. Uh, the second question um, was asking whether the person with PWS had been diagnosed by a blood test. So was it a clinical diagnosis or a uh, blood test based diagnosis? And this is important for a couple of reasons. Um, just because the blood test is a more accurate test, a genetic test is a more accurate test uh, than the clinical testing. Um, it's also important because many of the clinical trials will require that a patient is confirmed by genetic testing of having prader willi syndrome. And that's not to be exclusionary, that's because um, the companies or who, the principal investigators who are doing the studies really want to know that it is prader willi syndrome. They don't want to have a mixed population because they're specifically looking how their drug works in PWS. Um, and um, the vast majority of uh, 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 people had had um, uh, DNA testing, about 96%. Um, that was highest in the 0 to 4 group, um, which is great. It indicates that um, we're getting an early diagnosis and a DNA-based diagnosis. It, but it was also very high even in our adults with PWS, and um, I think that's good news. Um, what genetic subtype does a person with PWS have? We know that the majority of cases of PWS are a deletion of chromosome 15, and that was uh, the case here. About 50% of respondents said that it was PWS by deletion, 33% uh, UPD, uniparental disomy. Um, about 4% imprinting, which is a little bit higher than the literature reports. It reports about 2 or 3%, but still, you know, well within uh, what we expect. And there were some people who just had a DNA diagnosis of PWS, and the subtype had not been determined, and that was about 10%. And then there were a few that were not PWS or weren't were PWS based on uh, clinical criteria um, and not DNA testing. Uh, I want to ask you a question on this because I often see on Facebook where people are asking about the subtype of PWS and what they feel that there's an overrepresentation of UPD in the Facebook group. Does this um, questionnaire coincide with the literature for the deletion and UPD ratios? It's a little bit higher for, well, I guess it's, so what you normally hear is about um, close to 70% deletion, about 30% UPD, and then, um, I mean, that obviously adds up to 100, but, um, you know, 2 or 3% imprinting mutation. So um, there is some discussion that uh, UPD is becoming more common because that is a more common thing in uh, when when moms are a little bit older and since our population is having more women are having um, children when they're a little bit older that that proportion may be changing a little so some people will say 60 40 some people will say 70 30 this is a, the deletion is a little bit low but um, not too much that's interesting thank you um, the next slide just shows um, what age groups. So we had the, the biggest response from the zero to four, um, which I guess is indicative of those tend to be the, a, those, are, those are the people who are most electronically competent, perhaps, um, just speaking as someone in the 19 and older uh, parent age. Um, uh, I speak for myself, though. Uh, and uh, but a pretty good spread across the age groups, which I think is important. And there were over 300 uh, people who answered who had children 12 years old up 
12 years old and up. And I think that's important for some of the some of the early studies are going to be done in the 12 and up group, and that is based on a number of things. Number one, where it's clear that uh, those individuals are much more likely to have the hyperphagia behavior. They're more likely to have overweight and obesity uh, difficulties. Um, and from a drug development perspective, you have to do different things for a younger population than you have to do for an adolescent and adult population. So many of these drugs will start in older individuals with PWS, and as um, information is gained, the companies will develop a pediatric program and potentially bring the drug down into a younger population. But for many of these, we're, are, they're going to start in um, an adolescent and adult um, population, although obviously not all. Um, the next slide. Um, shows that we had, uh, we just put this out on Facebook and we invited everyone to participate. The majority of uh, individuals were from the United States and, um, you know, we we're specifically looking at the criteria or the information that the food, U.S. Food and Drug Administration is interested in, uh, but we're also interested in uh, the opinions around the globe about um, many of these aspects. So it was mostly the U.S., a little bit of Canada, United Kingdom, and the other. Um, we asked people to specify, and it's clear that PWS is a, is a global issue because um, we got responses from, from every continent and many countries, so that was great. Um, so the first set of questions about PWS was looking at the symptoms of PWS, um, what symptoms is your loved one with PWS experiencing, um, what, are the, what has the biggest impact on your life and um, the life of the caregiver and of the family. Um, so that's our first set of questions. Um, so the first question was really a, a the laundry list of uh, major symptoms associated with PWS and just asking the respondent um, which of these um, symptoms has your your loved one experienced. Uh, so uh, you can see the lawn, laundry list which includes hypotonia, feeding problems, developmental delay, intellectual disability, growth hormone deficiency. I won't read them all, um, but they're they're all there. So this is the uh, response, and th this is when we consider all of the respondents. So as you remember, um, it's it's a wide range of respondents, and the zero to fours are slightly overrepresented. And uh, you can see, and and throughout this presentation, I'll present some of the data as all responses, and then for where there's significant differences between the age groups, uh, I'll present. Uh, the breakdown by age group. So, so this just gives you the overall picture of some of the uh, symptoms and the, the um, frequency of, of issues in these areas. So everyone's experienced hypotonia, almost everyone's experienced the feeding problems, some degree of developmental delay or intellectual disability, growth hormone deficiency of course is very common, um, incomplete sexual development obviously is a less of an issue for, for uh, younger uh, individuals, so um, that number may be skewed because of that. Uh, high percent of, or relatively high percent of scoliosis, gastrointestinal problems, actually uh, for me, I was a little surprised it didn't score higher. About a third of people identified that as a major symptom. Lots of sleep apnea problems. Um, continued on the next slide. Hyperphagia or excessive eating was present in about half of individuals, but again, I'm going to show you by age group it differs. Uh, obesity, skin, peak, skin picking, and then we had several questions about behavior. So difficulty interacting socially, which gets more at that um, autism uh, piece since uh, autistic characteristics are not uncommon in PWS. Difficult behavior around food, difficult behavior uh, not around food, so uh, not food related. And then um, mental illness, which was uh, the more severe mental illness, including um, psychosis or, or major depression. So I think the next slide breaks that down by um, age group. You can see the younger uh, families uh, experience, you know, the hypotonia and feeding problems are, are their major issues, uh, and less of the, the hyperphagia and um, some of the uh, behavioral problems. Uh, as we go 
and, and this differs from the 19 and up, of course, where many of the problems, so this is consistent with what uh, is in the literature and, and what we hear from families, uh, what many of us have experienced, is that as time goes on, um, the hyperphagia develops, that excessive appetite develops usually um, sometime in, in mid-childhood, and so that by the time most individuals are late teens, uh, the vast majority of them are experiencing hyperphagia and also some of the behavior, difficult behavior around food, and there's an also an increase in behavioral problems and uh, mental health issues as well. So that's consistent with um, what's been reported um, previously. And the um, and now I'll just do it, uh, the top five symptoms uh, broken down by groups. Altogether, the um, intellectual disability and developmental delay was, across the board, was an important, uh, an important um, thing, issue in PWS. I think that sometimes that gets a little bit, um, um, it gets neglected a bit uh, because of the many problems with behavior and because of the hyperphagia. It is a significant uh, problem in all of our kids to some degree or another. And I think it's important to keep in mind in other disease areas or disorders with other disorders, genetic disorders, a lot of progress is being made uh, in this area. And there are many clinical trials ongoing for other genetic disorders like Down syndrome, like Fragile X, Rett syndrome, looking at potential drugs to help um, uh, improve cognitive ability. Uh, and, um, and that's something that I think w would be nice to look at in PWS as well. But anyway, um, so intellectual disability, hypotonia, of course, uh, and then the food-related behavior and hyperphagia are, are highest uh, across the board. Next slide shows the uh, zero to four group. And um, you can see the, the, the top difficulties there, of course, growth hormone deficiency across the board as well. The next slide shows the 5 to 11-year-olds. Um, and here you see some of the behavioral issues start coming up, some of the hyperphagia starts coming up, but it's still not a, sort of uh, the, the, the top difficulty. And then at 19 and above on the next slide, um, yeah, 19 and up. Hyperphagia is is the the symptom that people chose the most that impacted the day-to-day -day living right now. That hyperphagia and the, the behavior around food and the obesity that goes along with it. So, um, so again, that's not unexpected given what we know about Prader-Willi syndrome and how it changes over time. The next slide um, is looking at uh, the responses from uh, parents and caregivers who had uh, uh, their person with PWS was 12 years old or up, the top five symptoms that impacted their long-term goals. So what, what has had the most significant impact on the, the life of the person with PWS and their ability to achieve their long-term goals? And again, intellectual disability was a significant thing that, you know, was, was changing how um, the goals that people were able to reach, and then all of the hyperphagia and um, the uh, behaviors around hyperphagia, and, and also the anxiety and um, obsessive compulsive disorder and temper tantrums that um, occur in um, people with PWS are obviously challenging. Next slide. Um, and what do people worry about uh, for their uh, loved one with PWS? Hyperphagia is the biggest concern when we consider all of our responses and uh, the behavior around food um, uh, and the interaction socially. So not surprisingly, um, you know, we, we want our kids to have an easy time of interacting socially, so that's a concern as well. The next slide. Um, really started to look at um, what is the level of impact on your life. And again, we're gathering this information, I, um, not, not to feel sad about this, <laughs> but to define what are our needs as a community. And so the FDA is going to be looking at our attitudes about what is impacting our life and what is the level of impact on our life. And so I think it's important to uh, document the, 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 um, the level of impact on the individual with PWS and on their family. So here we were talking about the day-to-day -day impact uh, of PWS on the, the, 
person with PWS. So either mild, meaning that it's manageable disruptions, moderate, meaning that there's a regular uh, moderate disruptions in normally normal daily living, or severe, uh, indicating that there's frequent severe disruptions that affect every that that are affecting every day. And um, you can see again um, the level of uh, in the older individuals moderate to severe is um, are the highest ranking uh, levels of impact of PWS. The next slide um, uh, is looking at responses from ages 12 and up and how has P PWS impacted the ability of the person to reach their long-term goals and again um, in this uh, this question, there's been, uh, most people say that there's been a severe impact on the ability of the person to reach their long-term goals, um, and very few are saying that there's, there's little impact, and that's important. The next slide, um, how would you rate the impact on the primary caregiver? So we're, here we're asking, you know, mom or dad or the sibling who's taking care, what, what has been the impact uh, on your life? And most people responded that there's been a, a moderate uh, level of impact, and that is, um, you know, across, across the board, uh, across all ages. And then on the, the following slides, we started to ask in specific areas. So how would you rate the impact of PWS on the family of the person with, with uh, PWS? And again, um, there was significant impact across the board. Uh, I, I would imagine that that impact, you know, what that impact is, is changing over time. For younger families, it is um, the impact of having to go through all the medical uh, procedures, go to all the therapy sessions, uh, get the extra tutoring or whatever. For, for older individuals, it's more the behavior and some of the inability to do some of the social things that, that um, we might uh, be able to do otherwise. The next slide. Um, ask uh, to what degree has uh, PWS impacted a number of different aspects of the primary caregiver's life. So the financial, what is the financial impact, the social impact, the relationship on families, um, the health and the long-term goals. And you can see there's, there's some, there's some uh, you know, low to moderate impact in all of these, some, some severe impact. I would say across the board, stress is the thing that everybody, everybody picked either pretty much moderate or high level of stress, and that's understandable. Again, younger families, it's probably trying to manage all the medical uh, and therapies. Older families, um, it's different issues, but also um, very stressful. So um, unfortunately, we all have a lot of stress in our lives, and I guess that is not a surprise to anybody. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, the next set of questions really started to look at treatments. So are the existing treatments working for you and um, have they made a difference in the life of your loved one with PWS and what are you looking for in a new treatment? And this goes to the FDA's question of, you know, what are the unmet medical needs? So what are the issues um, that are impacting individuals with PWS and are current treatment options uh, making a difference or is there a deficit there that, you know, we need a new drug to come in? Um, so um, so the, our first question um, in this uh, was thinking about all the treatments that you have used for a person with PWS. And for this, we included um, not only drug treatments, but physical and occupational therapy, supplements that you're using, uh, maybe extra tutoring. And how well do you feel that these therapies are able to control the symptoms of PWS? And that would include environmental controls for, um, uh, for you know, keeping a very strict diet as well. So, and, and our answer options are left to right, that there's no effective therapy, that the treatment helps somewhat, that's the blue, the orange is that the treatment is very helpful, and then the, um, I guess the gray is that the treatment is helpful, but there's significant side effects, and that's an important um, aspect as well. If the FDA knows of a drug that's available, but the side effects are, are significant, they're more likely to look at a new drug that might re replace that older drug. So um, 
as you can see, the, the, the thing that ranked highest overall as being a very helpful uh, treatment available is the growth hormone deficiency, and of course that is growth hormone therapy. Uh, otherwise, um, for some of the hypotonia feeding problems and the intellectual disability or developmental disability, uh, developmental delays rather, um, the treatment is somewhat helpful uh, um, to moderately helpful. On the next slide, there's some, some more aspects. Uh, incomplete sexual development, scoliosis was something where um, there's a high level of uh, no effective treatment. Some people are seeing effective treatments, but of course there's a, also a lot of side effects for casting and surgery uh, and all of um, those treatments for scoliosis. Um, GI problems you can see there, and sleep, um, also some effectiveness with the, the currently available treatments. The next slide continues the process. Hyperphagia, of course, was the thing that got the highest rate of no effective therapy, where 72% uh, of respondents said there's currently uh, no, no effective therapy for hyperphagia. Obesity was much lower, and I think this may be an issue, not an issue, but this may be why we, the way we ask the question. Many of our um, younger kids and, and even many of our older adults with PWS are not overweight or obese, but it's uh, due primarily to environmental control. So that would be interesting to try, try to dissect out in future questioning. Um, Skin picking is a problem uh, for our population, for many of us at, at some point or another, um, and uh, the difficulty interacting socially uh, can be a challenge as well. The final slide in this series shows that um, there's uh, very little uh, effective treatments for the behavior related to food. Uh, maybe a little bit better for the non-food behaviors, but a challenge. The mental illness, there are drug therapies avail available, but of course the side effects are, are quite significant. So um, that's an area where there, there are drugs, but um, we could use much better drugs. Um, the next um, set of questions asked about um, what are you looking for in a new drug for prider release syndrome? What, what would have the, the biggest impact on the life of the person with PWS? And of course the thing that came up was a drug that would reduce the hunger. Um, people also wanted a drug that would reduce weight loss, but it's interesting to me that you know reducing the hunger, and I would agree, is, is the most important thing to our community. We'd also like a drug um, that improves uh, metabolic health and bone health, and, and here, um, again, from left to right, the responses are uh, not at all important, somewhat important, very important, or the most important. So um, for 74% of individuals answering, uh, the mo one of the most important aspects of a new drug for PWS would be that it reduces hunger. The next slide asks, uh, again, about some additional symptoms. You can see that the uh, behavior around food is something that people would like a drug to address, reducing the obsessive compulsive symptoms that many of our, our, our children and adults with PWS face is also important, reducing the temper tantrums, and reducing the severity or the um, lengthening the intervals between uh, problems with mental health obviously is also quite important for those individuals that have those, those problems. The next slide uh, it goes through a couple more of these, um, skin picking, uh, positive social interacting, improving social interaction, improving sleepiness, uh, which is a challenge for our kids, uh, intellectual disability and developmental delay. Again, uh, ranked high as something that um, people would like to see addressed with new therapies. And then also uh, allowing our kids to have a better stamina and participate in more activities. So our, our final set of questions was asking about attitudes towards clinical trials. What are your concerns? What are your hopes about clinical trials? Um, and um, so the first question in, in this area was, 
would you be willing to have your loved one with PWS participate in a clinical trial of an experimental or investigational treatment? And um, our responses were in general quite positive. So overall, 75% of um, people said yes. We had the caveat in there that, of course, you would want to uh, be comfortable with the um, with the risks and the potential benefits, and you would ha want to have all your answers questioned. But in that case, 75% of people overall said that they would be willing to uh, enroll their loved one with PWS in a clinical trial. Um, and, you know, about 20% were, or 20 to 30%, we're not quite sure, but we're still open to the idea. Uh, very few, uh, around 5%, less than 5% in uh, some age groups, uh, flat out said no, they would not consider a clinical trial for their individual with PWS. And I think it's interesting here, even in all age groups, greater than 90% of, in, of uh, caregivers or people completing the survey um, said that they would consider a, a, a clinical trial in the yes or the not sure. I think as a mom of an older child with PWS or a young adult child with PWS, I, I sometimes hear that um, my, my, my group, my uh, compatriots are, are not willing to, might not be willing to do um, clinical trials and, and I don't think that the data uh, here supports that. I think um, our community across the board is very supportive of clinical trials, which is great. The next slide, um, we just wanted to understand um, who would you trust to get information from about clinical trials. Um, so we asked uh, left to right, the, the, the colors are that you do not trust, you somewhat trust, you mostly trust, or you fully trust um, the, uh, the groups on the bottom, which would be the sponsor, the person who is uh, running the clinical trial. So that would be the, either the drug company or the university. And I think we have a fairly healthy skepticism of um, the information there, which I think is, which is probably a good thing. Uh, not, I mean, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I think we should all have um, a healthy skepticism and really want to uh, learn from multiple sources um, about a clinical trial. Our local doctors, I, I found that there were strong feelings uh, either one way or the other. Some people really trusted their local doctor. Some people did not trust their local doctor. So people split either high or low on that. The study team is the team that will be doing the clinical trial. So the site that you're going to, the, the clinician who's running the clinical trial and their study coordinator, and people had a pretty high level of trust in those individuals, and I think that is a well-placed trust. Um, it's important um, to feel comfortable with your study team. Your study team should have all of the information from the sponsor. They should have a good understanding. By law, the sponsor has to give them all of the information about the drug, all of the potential risks, all of the potential benefits, and they should have, um, they should be able to convey that to you in a way that um, you understand it. Um, the other group is the advocacy groups, including the Foundation for Predator Early Research and the Predator Early Syndrome Association USA. Um, and of course, we strive, uh, we appreciate your trust in us, and we, we strive to give you uh, balanced and uh, information that um, addresses both the risks and potential benefits, and we will continue to try to do that. And then the final group was other families, um, and um, again, people, uh, some people trusted other families and, and, and some people uh, felt strongly that they shouldn't. So uh, the next question was uh, about um, what factors would be important in your decision about whether to enroll a person with PWS in a study or not. Um, and you can see the responses here, feeling comfortable that you've had all of your questions answered about the risks and benefits, Oops. Um, feeling comfortable sorry, <laughs> uh, with the study sponsor, with the doctor and research team, having a study schedule that works with my schedule and the schedule of the person with PWS, having a study convenient study site, funds to cover my travel expenses, knowing that the person with PWS is interested in participating, so that are they able to consent to the process, um, knowing that the participation may lead to a new treatment for the person with PWS, 
um, that it might be the only way for a person with PWS to try out a new drug, and finally, knowing that participation in the clinical trial may help all people with PWS have access to a potentially effective therapy. So that was kind of the community um, uh, aspect of it. And the responses are shown here. The top three, of, of, of course, the first one makes sense, that you have all of your questions answered, that you're comfortable with the, the potential risk and the potential benefits of the drug. Um, the second highest response was that you're, you're comfortable with the study team. And again, I think that is uh, really important that you feel like you're getting the right information from them. They should be your source for understanding um, the study. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that the third highest response was that um, you're participating in a process that has the potential to help all people with PWS uh, have a safe and effective drug. And I think that is just reflective of our community, that we have a very strong um, community and that we all want everybody to have, uh, you know, new drugs that can help them. So I, I just I thought that was very nice. So what are the factors that are most likely to keep you from enrolling uh, in a PWS trial? Uh, and the first three responses had to do with uh, side effects, either common side effects, rare but serious side effects, long-term side effects. Um, and then um, there was some uh, uncertainty about whether the treatment would help. Um, concern that my child or a person is going to get a placebo. Concern that the drug may work but we won't be able to use it. Uh, some of the logistics and financial considerations and spending time away from family members. Uh, the other requirements of which on some of these trials there are significant, um, you know, other testing that has to be done. Um, and then finally feeling that things are okay and there's no need to try something new. Uh, and the responses are shown on the next slide. Um, and the Major concerns, uh, which again makes makes sense, are about the potential long-term side effects. So if there are any side effects that are not known, but potentially long-term, and, and I think it's important that we differentiate between that. In many cases, drugs will have potential side effects. Those side effects can be monitored for their known and their, uh, or they're suspected that they may be potential side effects. You can monitor for them, and in many cases the expectation is that as soon as you take the drug away or shortly thereafter, the side effect would go away. And of course the concern is about whether there might be long-term, longer-term side effects. Um, uh, rare but serious side effects, of course, is a concern. And then there, the next concern was the financial considerations for traveling. Um, and I think that it's important to note that in many of these studies, um, the, the study sponsor pays the travel costs and the, the related expenses of the study. Um, and so just keep that in mind as you're considering a, a potentially enrolling in a trial. At least the travel costs and associated expenses may well be covered um, by the, the study sponsor because they really have an interest once you're enrolled in the trial in making sure that you're able to come to the study site and get, get the study completed. And so they typically will set aside funds to support that effort. Uh, the next slide, um, we, we had a few open-ended questions at the end, um, just three, and uh, we got a lot of great comments back, and uh, we've read through those and um, are, you know, got a lot of insightful comments, thoughtful comments, um, and uh, many things that I think are going to shape our further conversations with uh, pharmaceutical companies as well as the FDA. I just wanted to point out a few of those. So we first asked about additional comments that you have on the impact of PWS on the person with PWS and their families. And again, I think the, uh, the, the take home message here is that there's so much stress on our families. Um, it's stress on the person with PWS, stress on the family, and it's kind of constant um, across uh, many years. Um, so, so that's a challenge. The feeling of being isolated was another one that was commonly uh, uh, voiced. Um, there are very few people who really understand what PWS means and how difficult and challenging it can be. Uh, mixed in with the comments, it was um, you could really see that uh, people found this a very challenging disorder, but they also loved uh, their child or the person with PWS so much, and um, you know really appreciated the positive aspects um, of that person as well. So we had a lot of comments about how hard it is, but I love my child, you know. 
Um, and as far as defining uh, the, uh, the highest level challenges, I think hands down it's the uh, hyperphagia and the behavioral problems um, that uh, concern people and the impact not only on the individual, which is significant, um, but also on the entire family um, across the board. So the second open-ended question that we had was um, whether you had um, additional comments on the next slide about um, the current treatments and whether they are adequately addressing the symptoms of PWS. And we asked this because um, we wanted to gather um, responses to share with the FDA. Um, and I brought out my favorite response first. Um, they are not. Duh. Uh, so I think there's uh, a real feeling in the community that the current treatments are not adequate for the, um, the, the symptoms of PWS, um, except in very rare, in very narrow places, for example, growth hormone deficiency and growth hormone. But, but in many other areas, they don't begin to touch uh, the symptoms in a way that is clinically meaningful. Um, and I think this is a message that we need to bring very strongly to the FDA when they're considering a new therapy that um, there is this tremendous unmet medical need. Um, the therapies that we have, by and large, are not uh, adequate for our kids and that, um, you know, they really need to take that into consideration um, as far as um, considering drugs and the speed at which they consider drugs and, um, you know, the um, what they require from the, the clinical trials in order to approve a drug. Obviously, we all want a safe drug and we want the trials to be uh, complete and we want them to be large enough that um, we get a good read on what the safety concerns might be, uh, but we also obviously do not want to make the trial so onerous that the process takes too long and that, you know, the, the companies are not able to move these uh, these drugs forward in a way that um, we can have access to them as, as a community. And I, I like the last comment on this slide, um, you know, that um, the, the, the concerns change over time and so we need to be cognizant of that, that the concerns and the potential therapies for a four-year-old are not the same concerns and therapies that that individual will have or need when they're, you know, 15 or 25. Um, so that was an important point. Um, and then additional comments about uh, PWS clinical trials. Uh, there were many positive comments, of course, to people who wanted more trials and were interested in enrolling and finding out more information, and that was great to see. A couple of things that came up that I think are concerning, and I would, um, you know, ask if if you have a similar experience to let us know because we can go back potentially to um, the study sponsor and, and relay this information. Uh, one person wrote that they had contacted a trial, asked for information, and, and, and nothing was ever sent. And we do not want to see that, obviously. We want to see people who are interested in clinical trials get the information that they need to be able to make a decision about whether the trial is for them or not. Um, and so anything we can do to facilitate that process is great. Um, and I think this comment here about the impact on the PWS patient, knowing that they are in a trial, that it's going to be a lot to obsess about, I think that just brings up the point that these trials are, 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 are going to be a challenge for us who choose to enroll in them. And I think that, um, you know, we need to come at, at these trials with the attitude that um, not only is it to help our our child with PWS, but to help the whole community, and we need to think of it as um, as a way to contribute. Um, so, so it is going to be hard. I know for for my son, sort of schlepping him to a um, study site and uh, having to do that again and again is is, is challenging. So, um, I think we just need to uh, be ready, or hopefully, many of us are ready to accept that challenge. Um, and the final comment that I have here is um, I do not think placebo should be given. Those who do not particip participate provide the baseline. I'll just point out that in many cases the FDA, the FDA requires a placebo control um, that runs concurrently with the study drug um, because that is the most rigorous uh, clinical trial design. And so that's why the companies and uh, universities are designing the trials this way is because it's the most rigorous way, it's the best way to get the, the data. Um, I think that um, the 
the study sponsors are uh, cognizant of this this issue that people don't want to enroll and get a placebo the whole time, and so many of them have uh, an open label at the end where if you are on the study, if you are in the study, and you end up on the placebo arm at the end of the trial, you can get um, you can receive the drug to see whether it has an effect in in um, the your loved one with PWS. So just keep that in mind. Even if it says it's a placebo controlled trial, it's worth getting more information because um, in many cases you will have access to the study drug. Um, and I would just encourage you to um, be looking and getting more information about all of these trials and talking to the study site or the sponsor or PWSA or FPWR um, and we can help direct you to get your, your questions answered. Um, so, so please be proactive about finding out this information and seeing if, if a, a particular trial is right for you. Uh, I think uh, future steps, we're going to be um, developing uh, a benefit risk assessment that delves further into what sort of level of risk uh, people in our community are willing to accept. Um, oh, and that's the slide I think I didn't finish. Engage um, state stakeholders to uh, promote to advance the clinical trials. So I think the last slide um, just gives you um, uh, one place to get information um, that we try to keep up to date is on the FPWR site. We have a clinical trials um, web page that we try to update regularly. You can sign up for a clinical trials alert that will send you an email when a new clinical trial opens. We're going to send one out probably within the next week because uh, there is a new trial that is uh, opening uh, for, I believe it's 16 year olds and up. Uh, for, with the uh, RM493, so um, please sign up for the clinical trials alert um, and we'll keep you abreast of all of the studies that are, are opening. So that's all the information I have for this evening. Thank you so much for um, attending and I guess Susan will take uh, or help me take any questions. Sure, so if anyone has questions from today's presentation, you're welcome to type them in or raise your hand and we'll take you off mute so that you can ask your questions personally. Teresa, I think you did such a great job that everybody's floored because we're not receiving any questions. Okay, I guess that's a good sign or a bad sign, but I'll take it as a good sign. Um, well, as always, we are available if you uh, have questions after the webinar. We, I've also recorded the webinar this evening, and we will make this available to you. So if you would like to review any of the material that has been covered tonight, it will be available. All right. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're going to go ahead and sign off. We will, um, again, be available if you have any questions. Thank you for joining us, and we'll be in contact with you soon. Have a great evening. Good night.